In this episode of Detroit Performs, a painter and drawer, an abstract artist, and an illustrator. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm at Brightly Twisted, located in Detroit's Corktown neighborhood, to participate in a tie-dye workshop. So, throughout the episode, you'll see Zach McKeever teach us the steps of the tie-dye workshop. So take it away, Zach. All right, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw two circles on this piece of fabric in front of us. I'm gonna do a fairly big one, and I'm gonna do a small one. They don't have to be perfect. They're not gonna be perfect. <laughs> don't get caught up on your circles. So just go ahead. Just like that, just like that. All right, so as I finish up my circle here, let's check out our next artist, Robert Sheffman, who's working on an exhibition based on Stranger Secrets. Take a look. The most important thing you can do is invest yourself in the work and be willing to take and use what is most appropriate in terms of the skill to get your idea across. Since I was a kid, I always loved art, but I also liked medicine as well. So actually, when I was in high school, I had an internship down at Receiving Hospital doing autopsies. That experience gave me a different perspective on the human body, about being us, and eventually that found its way into my work. What you see in terms of my paintings and my sculptures is not the way I was trained. Back in the 70s, you were pretty much discouraged from doing anything that was illusionist like I paint. You were also discouraged from doing anything with the figure. But I finally went in that direction and it seemed like endless possibilities as opposed to dead end. So I went there. I'm making an illusion, it's just a magic trick. I wanna see where I can take and use illusion to make metaphor, to use symbol to relate to different issues. The inspiration can come from any place. You take an idea and you run with it and you develop it a thousand different ways and explore wherever it will take you. If you have the guts to go to places that were quote forbidden, fine. It's not about starting in any specific way. So sometimes I might see something that, that sparks an idea and it goes in my sketchbook. I might work that and develop an idea. Then again, it might take five years before that idea, which I see in that sketchbook over and over and over, kind of coalesces with other things that I see and it's suddenly, wow, these things go together and they make a different thing than I wanted to say before, but it's unique. Ideally, what, what I like to do when working in series is take an idea and I'm exploring different things that are relative to that and trying to explore as many as I can and develop images from that. So they're all gonna be different. The series that I'm working on now, which is the secrets. So I solicited secrets across the internet and people sent me personal secrets. Everyone's secret is not unique. In fact, I had very few unique secrets. By using that secret, not as a, an illustration of what they sent, but talking about uh, more internal feelings, uh, developing an image based on that idea. Some of the secrets were more personal, less political. Some were more political, less personal. Some of the secrets were legal issues. <laughs> And, but it was enlightening. The biggest secret that Americans keep right now seems to be um, suffering from depression and everything that goes with that. And so because of that, 
it became the largest painting that I was going to do in the series. And I wanted a, a take on that being otherworldly and right in this world at the same time, because that is what we do. Depression is something you are right in this world, yet you can't take a point of view that keeps you in this world. There's another painting in the show that is someone who was in love with their best friend and couldn't tell them. And it was about sexuality and about choice and about also the hiding. And that internal struggle is what I tried to get on the, the canvas. And then there was a lot of people who were hiding sexual orientation, uh, drugs and addictions to either food or different drugs and alcohol. There was lots of, lots of stuff for me to explore. Some of the people actually wrote again to tell me how cathartic it was that they'd been holding this secret for 45 years and never told anyone. And that the experience of putting it down and sending it out released them in a way. The Carbon series started with a trip to the Middle East. And I was most impressed by this intersection of politics and religion and the carbon. The carbon was a part of all the decisions in religion, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Us as human beings, we are carbon. In the Middle East, so much of what was going on was not just about religion, but the religions controlling other carbon issues, resource carbon issues, political carbon issues. And this intersection where all of this was coming together gave me a notion about this carbon series and then a, a series of paintings called Politics and Religion. And the two are integrated. So the carbon series was drawings and everything I did was made out of carbon, about carbon. And the paintings were uh, more about the political and the religious aspects of this carbon system. My process has always been starting from a blank sheet of paper. When you start with a drawing that has no direction, everything is possible. And I'll use the drawing and I will make hundreds of drawings until one strikes me as making that agenda hit as much as possible, being as direct to what I want to say. And then when I start painting, it's still a moving target. And things are going to change when, when I start painting. And uh, either for visual reasons or for content reasons, this is illusion. It's not real. It's just pixels on a page. And if you think about the pixelization of an image, this is how painters have always worked. Only instead of digital pixels, it's a brushstroke. So every brushstroke is a different color. And how illusionist you want this work to be is how often you change the pixels. I'm changing the pixels as much as I can. Uh, that experience, that illusion is important to me. It's not the focus, but it's how I want to get the idea across. And so if I want to paint a hand or an arm, it'll probably be 15 different colors. And I will start with those and then intermix and change those depending on how it goes. My paintings are not about paint. It was about what I wanted to say. You take an idea and you make an image, and I've been fortunate enough to have moved enough people that they will give me a platform, meaning shows, whether it's galleries or museums. When you get the work out there, people come and see the work. I'll get letters back saying, oh, this affected me, that affected me. I think that that's the communication factor. That's that image transferring information from one person to another. You're trying to affect someone. You could go in a closet and make all your work and burn the closet down. You, you fulfilled only half of the issue of the arts. The arts is communication without the audience. You have not fulfilled all the mission. Good, you're a pro. All right. <laughs> Next up, abstract artist Matt Eaton explores themes of nostalgia and space. I was born in Northern California, but um, my family lived in Los Angeles until I was about 11. Then we moved to uh, London, England and lived there until I was about 20 before moving back to Michigan. Actually, we had never lived in Michigan before, so we moved to Michigan. 
My father was actually a photographer um, and worked um, in Miami and Detroit and um, in the West Coast in California as well. He used to be a, uh, a model for like Hudson's, the department store here in Michigan. Being on the other side of the lens, I think when he was really young, inspired him to pick up the camera. There's always been creative people around us. So my brother and I grew up in the kind of household that was, we were constantly surrounded by creatives, um, actors, or poets, or dancers, and musicians. Well, I mean, I first thing I'd probably lead your eye to is the horizon line. This represents the horizon for me. This is an experience out in the high desert. <clears throat> um, and basically what, what I was seeing was this beautiful sand and landscape with shadow being cast across it with rocks and boulders. So all of this represents that positive and negative created by the sun and light and shadow. And this is all the trees in the background off in the distance and in the low mountain range. So this is kind of the, the easiest way for me to express without being obvious um, about a specific location um, or, or geographic kind of um, experience. But this is what I found beautiful in this personal experience for me. I was in this part of nature and I stood and I looked upon this vista and what stood out for me were the way the shadow and the light was dancing with these rocks and then the kind of how <clears throat> linear and flat this was juxtaposed with these tree forms vertically and the uplifting kind of motion of the mountains. So <clears throat> this is just a horizon line. This represents one part of the view and this represents the other part of the view and it can be whatever you want it to be too, obviously, but um, this is, I guess, the, the easiest way for me to kind of extrapolate or extract and then extrapolate upon the simple pleasures of that view for me. Um, a, a painting like this exists in my head for a great deal of time before it actually manifests physically. Um, I wrangle with how to, uh, you know, I, I look at the, the photos I took of this area and I try to remember that experience and, and try to just bring to the surface what is important for me to uh, express in that telling of this story. So in this way, like the, the orange of the desert floor stood out. You know, the, the light blue and the, the kind of edge of the shadow stood out. So those are the things I choose to amplify. Um, <clears throat> if I was to explore every single item in, uh, in that view, then it would be chaos or it would be a photorealistic painting, and I find that boring. Um, I appreciate it, I'm boring for myself, and I also am not talented, even close to talented enough to do that. So, um, <clears throat> so that, that's what, I mean, I do think there's merit in refining that viewpoint and finding those points that really emphasize the story you're telling and um, the way you tell that story. You know, putting everything out there all the time um, just becomes chaotic. You know, it, it's hard to uh, understand what you're trying to say. It's hard to have a voice. Uh, I'm the program manager for Red, Red Bull Arts Detroit. Um, it's a residency program for uh, national artists. Um, hoping to open it up internationally next year. Uh, we have three residencies that consist of three artists at a time through the year. Um, then we have a curatorial fellowship that's uh, about 10 or 12 months long. And every two months we have a literary or writer's fellowship. Um, people come and visit and write and inter engage with the city and our other artists here. And every month we have a micro grant only for local artists. We're located in Eastern Market um, in Detroit. And uh, we've been there since about uh, in operations in about 2012. Um, so that I'm, I'm very proud of that program. Um, it's evolved um, beyond my wildest dreams, but um, I expected it to because it's, uh, it's feeding into a community of people that um, value um, that action, you know, supporting artists and trying to find the most um, authentic, 
and honest way of supporting arts and culture in the city um, and redefining corporate patronage and what it means. When someone comes from Berlin or elsewhere, it's this mysterious place where all these amazing things have happened. So how can you feel inferior about this place of wonder? You know, people, people are curious about this place because so much cool stuff has happened here. So many amazing people and personalities have come from this place. So of course, it's put on a pedestal as it should be. You know, if you're feeling inferior about this city, then the problem lies within you. What's up guys? I am hanging out here with Lily Bishop, whose mom makes the quilts here. So Lily, tell me a little bit about these quilts. So I love the dye classes, and one of the reasons I love them is because they are such a bringing together a merger of community. Not only do the participants get to create something that they get to keep that's meaningful and one of a kind, but they also get to contribute to the community in another way, and it is these quilts. Um, my mom is actually as the seamstress behind them. So in the quilts you see a square of the practice piece like we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, mom kind of goes crazy. She kind of <laughs> goes nuts. She really dips into it and she really does a little bit of herself. So you have like the Jeannie Nicholson side and you also have the Bradley Twisted side. Okay. Um, it's really unique because she's got a head injury. About 13 years ago she was involved in a catastrophic car accident. Mm. Uh, she was in a coma. And uh, we didn't know if she was going to live. She was actually given a 7% chance to live and a 1% chance to be out of a vegetative state. Mm. So um, it's, it's kind of miraculous that she's even here with us, Absolutely. let alone able to continue in her craft and in her art. It's been such a beautiful, tangible story, what she's been able to make. And uh, I think everyone in my family has <laughs> lots of quilts. Yeah. But it wasn't until uh, these classes and this collaboration with Brightly Twisted mm -hmm. that these quilts have really come alive and become something that we can give to the community. Yeah, so how do people feel once they get these quilts? How's the response? Honestly, I think uh, the reception I think has been wonderful and definitely brings tears to my eyes. Right. You know, it's so great for my mom to have a voice again. Thank you so much, Lily, for letting me be a part of this. I want to give you a hug, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing our story. Oh, appreciate it. All right, now let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. All right, so now we're at the tie-dye process. So can you help us out here, Zach? Yes, absolutely. Right. What we're gonna do, um, we've got hearts here that we okay. twisted earlier. Okay. I always find it's best to start with the pink for the center, so grab okay. this guy right here. This is pink. And you can just follow right along with me. We're gonna go right up to this first rubber band. Okay. So this big chunk in the center, and really saturate it. Don't be shy about using that dye. Okay. Now if you wanna go into this one right here. Purple. Yep. Okay. Same thing we did before. I'm gonna overlap both of these rubber bands. So we're going to start there. It's going to bleed up into the pink. That's good. We want that. Okay. So you've got a short little bottle in there with a fine tip. Mm -hmm. Black dye. We use black dye in almost every piece we make. Now all I'm going to do is right over top of these rubber bands, I'm just going to draw straight lines. It's going to okay. look like it's going everywhere. Okay. I promise you it's not. So that's all we're going to do five or six times back and forth. Okay. And we'll do that for each rubber band. Stash them right in here. All right. There we go. All right, thank you, man. You are welcome. All right, now let's check in with our next artist, Gabriella Riveros, 
who's making a name for herself in the art community with her unique illustrations based on her Paraguayan heritage. Gabriela Riveros and I grew up on the west side of Milwaukee, um, born and raised, and my parents are from Asuncion, uh, Paraguay. Uh, so growing up I always kind of been into drawing and then uh, I happened to go or be lucky enough to go to schools that specialize in art. So, um, amounting to my college career, uh, I thought illustration was the best fit because my drawings always told a story of some sort. So, uh, my designs, I like to focus on like history and culture. I'm really into heritage, um, especially Latino heritage. So. I try to integrate as much like history and kind of like lineage and I research a lot of tradition and kind of like retranslate that into something that people can relate to modern day. Recently my biggest inspiration is like Latino literature. So I, I really draw my inspirations from like the past. Um, for my audience though I'm really inspired by people like me who want to know more about their identity and kind of like connect more with that because I think a lot of times people kind of lose their like cultural roots. I first um, started really getting into it when I actually went back to Paraguay and then um, I've been uh, just taking notes and like creating art while I was there and soaking up uh, it's like the own traditions that I would normally kind of like look past and just do. Uh, and then doing on my own time researching like Paraguayan history and art and understanding where everything comes from that we have present in our culture, like all the indigenous roots and the um, like Spanish roots and how all of those combine. I think I really love kind of like the mythology because Paraguayans are like well, they're like the ultimate mestizo for the most part, but like the indigenous is Guarani and um, the Guarani traditions and like culture is very present with us. So uh, one of my favorite things I take away from that is all the old tales and I love um, all the art along with it. They do a lot of traditional weavings and they have these really special delicate weavings that I incorporate a lot into my work as like an inspiration. Um, so the ones that I've done that have been most important to me was probably be um, some pieces from my um, undergrad work. There was one that I made that was very conceptual. It was about Day of the Dead and it was this young girl that was reconnecting with her, um, with her roots and she had a bunch of like um, Jose Posada skeletons dancing around her and after that was like oh like I really like the way this looks so I guess that was one of my most important pieces. I kind of launched um, the series of my current work. I have worked with uh, Colectivo Coffee, Cafe Corazon. I recently just worked with uh, this nonprofit called Noxteen out of California. Uh, Milwaukee Film Festival. This year, they want to do something crazy, colorful, and detailed. So they were trying to look for an artist that fit that bill. Um, so I had a professor that recommended me, so we linked up and they said, oh, your work's perfect for this. Um, the theme of it was the wild side of Milwaukee. Uh, so my main inspiration for that piece was medieval art. So the, la the main layout is based off Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, the center panel where um, it's kind of like this heavenly landscape. If you know your history well, you'll notice like medieval beasts that I've kind of reinterpreted as Milwaukee citizens. And then uh, I was also inspired by drolleries, which were uh, medieval, they were like really weird medieval doodles in the margins of illuminated manuscripts. So 
I usually start my um, drawings on paper and then I um, scan them in the computer and then with the computer I, um, I basically draw and paint digitally. I start out with research, that's always my base, so I like read, a, I, I have a subject I'm kind of interested in knowing more about, so I research it and then I do a lot of drawing and I collect a lot of images and I just keep drawing until I find the composition I'd like and then I transform it into like an illustration. I always encourage uh, younger people to just kind of experiment, don't be afraid to experiment and try out new things because you never know, it could push your work in a whole new direction. And I'm torn between the actual researching part and then like the final piece because it feels really good when I have just see it all finished and pristine. It's really cool seeing more of the audience come out and um, relate and connect with my work. Uh, I love it when other uh, Latinos come up to me and are saying like, "Oh, I love this! Like this is part. Like this is I identify with it." And I'm like, "Awesome! That's my goal." <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeannie. Thank Appreciate you. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. I'd like to thank Brentley Twisted for having me here today to participate in a tie-dye workshop. You can create your own beautiful tie-dye pieces by coming down to Brentley Twisted during the scheduled workshop or booking your own private workshop. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.